Ezra Pound, a revolutionary simpleton. Review of Ezra Pound, Poet, Volume 1, 1885-1920, by A. David Moody. The Atlantic, April 2008. The imposing first volume of A. David Moody's biography of Ezra Pound, which takes us up to the publication of Hugh Selwyn Morbelly and the writing of the early cantos, deserves to stand in its own right as a study of Pound's germinal years. But no sooner has one written the word germinal than one begins to experience the desire to peep ahead at the ending, or rather to look in the beginnings for symptoms of the terminus. I found myself doing this even with the very impressive photographs that Moody has collected. In most of them, Pound looks like a highly well-made young man with an ironic and quizzical expression. He's especially dashing in an extraordinary group shot taken in January 1914, where he stands in a cluster of talent, which includes W.B. Yeats and Richard Aldington, around the patriarchal figure of Wilfred Scorum Blunt. There's no apparent sign of the obsessive crank of the declining years, barking obscenities and gibberish over Mussolini's radio. Yet on the cover of the book, and reproduced inside, is a 1910 study from Paris, in which Pound confronts the camera with a hunched, autistic, haunted look with a tinge of Van Gogh to it. Pound's early life story is in some respects not unlike that of T.S. Eliot, the man who, in his dedication to the wasteland, called Pound Il Milio Fabro, which can mean either the better writer or the better craftsman. They shared the same desire to escape from provincial gentility in America to Europe, and perhaps especially to England, the same struggle to convince parents and family that the effort was one worth endorsing and financing the same quixotic belief that poetry could be made to yield a living and that poets were a special class, and the same register of annihilating shock when in the summer of 1914 the roof of the over-admired European civilization simply fell in. It's always impressive to read of the sheer dedication and conviction with which Pound approached poetry and of the immense hopes he entertained for its regenerative powers. In a single season between 1912 and 1913 in London, we find him taking up the Bengali master Rabindranath Tagore and advising the Irish genius Yeats. Moody writes, The measures, melodies and modulations of the songs in their original Bengali, which he had Tagore sing and explain to him, interested him as a seeker after fundamental laws in word music and seemed to correspond to the sort of metric he was working for in English. He went on to wax enthusiastic about the prospect of Bengali culture providing the balance and corrective to a Western humanism which had lost touch with the whole and the flowing. We have found our new Greece, he declared, in the midst of our clangor of mechanisms. But within a short time he had tired of all this wholeness and flowing and suspected Tagore of being just another theosophist and was sitting up late with Yeats to help revise the two kings line by line. Yeats was urged to purge his verses of their Miltonic generalizations, and he told Lady Gregory that Pound helped him to get back to the definite and the concrete away from modern abstractions. To talk over a poem with him is like getting Jan to put a sentence into dialect. All becomes clear and natural. It must be reckoned immensely to Pound's credit that he so early detected the vitality and importance of Eliot and of Yeats, going so far as to write that the latter is the only living man whose work has more than a most temporary interest. I shall survive as a curiosity. That second observation has a curious prescience to it. Meanwhile, one might note that he wasn't always such a sufferer from false modesty. It was at the same time that he composed his Ballad of the Goodly Fear telling his father that it was probably about the strongest thing in English since Reading Jail. In its evocation of the crucifixion, a little bizarre in view of Pound's general contempt for Christianity, the Ballad of the Goodly Fear is a strangely affecting and beautiful piece of work, but it doesn't place him in the same class as Wilde. It's incidentally interesting for being written in dialect and for hitting an early and clearer note of Pound's later dark obsession with usury. I have seen him drive a hundred men where a bundle of cords swung free, that they took the high and holy house for their pawn and treasury. 
Pound's mood swings, between feelings of unworthiness and grandeur, may nonetheless supply a clue. Just as he would ricochet from new enthusiasm to new influence, at different times, Rudyard Kipling, James McNeil Whistler, on whose signature he modelled his own, Ernest Dowson and Wilfred Owen, so his sail was rigged in such a way as to be swollen by any febrile gust of enthusiasm. Under the influence of T.E. Hume and Wyndham Lewis, he made what was certainly the most extreme contribution to the inaugural issue of Lewis's vorticist magazine, Blast, published on the unintentionally momentous day of June the 20th, 1914 one week before the Archduke's murder in Sarajevo. The same issue contained a story by Rebecca West and the first chapter of Ford Maddox Ford's The Good Soldier, while Pound emitted a statement titled The Turbine. The vortex is the point of maximum energy. All experience rushes into this vortex. All the energized past, all the past that is living and worthy to live. All momentum, which is the past bearing upon us. Race, race memory, instinct charging the placid, non-energized future, the design of the future in the grip of the human vortex. All the past that is vital, or the past that is capable of living into the future, is pregnant in the vortex, now. Again, one can surely be forgiven for seeing a harbinger here, and not only of eventual mental unhingement. In fact, though strictly speaking it lies outside the scope of Moody's book, let me quote from what Wyndham Lewis was later to write about experiencing the energy-loving and race-memory-oriented fascism that he had at first welcomed so warmly. The senseless bellicosity of the reactionary groups of the Action Francaise type may certainly result in far more violence before long than anyone is able to measure. On another occasion he wrote, Fascists have the word action on their lips from morning to night. In the same book, Time and Western Man, he described his former blast colleague Ezra Pound as a revolutionary simpleton. That could perhaps furnish a title for Moody's second volume. Lewis, of course, turned against fascism, if only because he decided that it was ultimately just as mob-centered as democracy. Pound's contempt for democracy was of a more determinedly elevated and artistic type. It's rather charming to find him turning up at the United States Embassy in London in 1918, opposing the possible drafting of T.S. Eliot into the army on the grounds that if it was a war for civilization, not merely for democracy, it was folly to shoot or have shot one of the six or seven Americans capable of contributing to civilization or understanding the word. In a letter home to his father, discussing his own prospects as a conscript, Pound stated more tersely, it is not, however, the habit of democracies to use my sort of intelligence. It's difficult to gauge how much this rather airy solipsism had to do with a version of survivor guilt or an awareness that friends like Ford and Lewis either had endured the test of wartime experience or, like Henri gaudier jusca creator of the brilliant statue of Pound that its subject happily considered phallic, had not survived it. And this must bring us to the writing of Hugh Selwyn Morbelly, which was his farewell to England and his envoy also to both democracy and civilization. I've never especially admired the bitch-botch echo in the poem, which speaks of the huge wartime sacrifice in which Pound himself played no part, and then describes it as having been made for an old bitch gone in the teeth for a botch civilization. The whole thing reeks of trying too hard, and it anticipates the fanatical drone of Canto 14 in which Londoners are described as living in a place full of financiers, lashing them with steel wires, and the slough of unamiable liars, bog of stupidities, malevolent stupidities, and stupidities, the soil living pus full of vermin, dead maggots begetting live maggots, slum owners, usurers squeezing crab lice. Sometimes credited with presaging or echoing the wasteland, this stuff actually bodies forth and even exceeds the lowest of Eliot. And there can be small doubt, even on a brisk review of the lines, of the sordid direction in which things are tending. Towards the close of this dense and clever and generally sympathetic study, Moody does cite an essay by Pound on the tribe of Judah and the pawn shop, where, as he deftly points out, there is a telltale confusion between Judaism and the Jew. 
This distinction would eventually become completely lost on Pound, whose eccentric article was written for A.R. Orage's New Age, in the offices of which, and what a life he lived for the small and obscure magazine, Pound was to meet Major C.H. Douglas, the crackpot greenshirt founder of the social credit movement. In Douglas's programme, Pound had found his true music, a blend of folkloric Celtic twilight with a paranoid hatred of the money economy and a dire suspicion about an ancient faith. Moody supplies two very telling examples. In April 1917, Pound had written to his friend John Quinn, urging him to impress on Theodore Roosevelt, of all people, the need for some system of direct supply, straight from the factory to the particular section of the front where stuff is wanted. But this amateur planner megalomania was only a foretaste of the pathos to come. In 1921, just before his departure from England, Pound managed to corner Arthur Griffith, easily the most reactionary and ethereal of the Irish leaders, during the tortured negotiations for his nation's independence. He ranted at Griffith in an attempt to convince him to adopt social credit so as to use the infant Irish Republic as its laboratory. According to Pound, Griffith eventually responded, All you say is true, but I can't move them with a cold thing like economics. Mooney does not mention it, but this very phrase later recurs as a line in Canto 19, by which time Pound's poetry had become little more than a doctrinaire and propagandistic screed, a mechanical attempt to make poetry do what economics could not. That such an outcome was a tragedy no reader of this biography can doubt. If one seeks or desires to explain the tragedy, one might say that Shelley wanted poets to be the unacknowledged legislators of the world while Pound sought hectically for acknowledgement, not just for poetry, but for himself, and lost the sense of both in the process. <laughs>